He smiled mischievous, my mother said, like he was picking life's pocket, like he was getting away with something by hanging around and breathing air. He was just another lint head kid, but as different from the other men she knew, the brush arbor prophets, pulp wooders, and shade tree mechanics, as the mannequin in Steinberg's department store was from a cornfield scarecrow. And when it was time to go, he slid behind the wheel and turned the key. And he looked like an angel, one of the fallen kind. As the big engine caught fire and he vanished in a blue-black, oily, noxious cloud. <laughs> His car burned a lot of oil, she said. <laughs> it burnt so much oil that a cloud followed him all around town. Burnt so much oil he couldn't keep oil in it. But instead of getting it fixed, he'd just go out to that filling station out on the highway. He'd pull it up to a barrel of the burn oil they drained out of people's cars. <laughs> he'd dip it out in a bucket and put it in his old car and he'd just ride and ride. <laughs> People used to laugh at him. They'd say, here comes that brag boy in a cloud of smoke. You know, it's funny, I read that out loud to people in Sausalito and they didn't get it at all. <laughs> I should have known if I read it out loud to people in Michigan, they go, yeah! <laughs> Car burns oil, yeah, it smokes, yeah, we get that. <laughs> she remembers him that way, in smoke, but sometimes, in a blue moon, she remembers him on his knees. It was about four months after we started seeing each other and we was at Germania Springs and he was getting him a drink of water laying on his belly on the creek bank. You could drink it right out of the creek then and it was good and cold. Well, he got a drink and he turned and looked at me. Will you marry me, he said, and I laughed at him and he got mad. I think he cussed a little too. But I mean, who asked somebody to marry them while they're on their belly getting a drink of water? <laughs> You're kidding, ain't you, I told him, and he cussed again. He said, hell, I was serious. Will you marry me? But I giggled again. I just couldn't quit. But she can still see him pushing himself up to his knees for a little dignity for a second. Just a second. He faced her on one knee. Just like in a storybook. I mean it, God damn it, he said. <laughs> Stories indifferently in Alabama. <laughs> His face was bright burning red. Will you or not? The old men laughed at him, all duded up with that oil bucket in his hand. The women loved his face. Even men, men so afraid of appearing feminine they'd walk a wide loop around the unmentionables in Sears to avoid being in the proximity of a panty. <laughs> See, y'all got that too. <laughs> I'm, I might just move in here. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many places I read that out loud and people go. <laughs> he had a movie star squared off chin with a dashing white line across it like a dueling scar. He got it one night drunk when he banged his face on the steering wheel. <laughs> but it made him look mysterious and a little dangerous all the same. He had Indian blood and cheekbones proud and high and his face tanned to a dark red. His ears and Adam's apple were too big, but his hands were small and delicate as a woman's. He talked country but dressed for town, as all the boys from the mill village did back then. A hybrid hillbilly with silver dimes flashing in his black penny loafer shoes. He chained smoke pal mouths and toted a thin yellow handled knife in his left hip pocket so he could get at it quick. He raised fighting dogs, bet on chickens, and loved vanilla ice cream. And I guess he was a scoundrel before he knew what a scoundrel was. He would cut you if you hemmed him up, said my father's cousin, Carla Slapped whose daddy named him after a label he saw on a crate of Mexican apples in Christmas 1932. <laughs> you can't make this up. <laughs> you 
You just, you just can't make it up. Um, so I went about the business of getting people to tell me a story about my dad. Found some beautiful stories. Found an old man named Jack Andrews living in a mobile home on top of a mountain. And he was so slow coming to the door the first time I ran off and left before he got there and opened the door. <laughs> and I told Jack, I said, will you tell me one good story about my daddy? And he said, yeah, come in. He told me 40. And the best one, I think, is not the most poignant. But it was when he and my daddy were boys and, you know, we got a lot of code words in the deep south. You know, um, like for instance, all right. If you know, somebody will say, did your Uncle James come to see you? And they'll say, yeah, but he was all right. Anybody know what all right means? What does it mean? It means sober. <laughs> all right, for the rest of your life, if you're ever south of Chattanooga, you know. I don't have to tell you all that. Half of y'all have cousins that came up here to hang bumpers on Cadillacs. <laughs> You know, uh, but uh, you know, they code another code word that you know that we that we have is uh, like this is one of my favorites. Is uh, does that car use any oil? Ain't used none since I've had it. <laughs> they tend not to use oil when they are up on blocks behind the barn. <laughs> but another code is, is, uh, is and y'all might have heard this, liberated. Anybody know what liberated means? Stole. Stole. <laughs> Anyway, Jack told me, he said, me and your daddy liberated about four miles of nylon cord from the cotton mill. And we built a kite. And it was a, one of those days when the wind blows strong, but there aren't any clouds. And we just let it go. And the only thing between you and forever, if you've got a good kite, is structural engineering and cord. Even when, once you get it up there, it and survival is core. They just let it go. And they would feed it, line, just lay there. Until it went almost completely out of sight. And this little boy comes walking toward them. My daddy looks over at Jack and says, uh, don't say a word. The little boy walks up and he says, what are y'all doing? And they just lay there holding to a string that went into the sky and disappeared. <laughs> and every few minutes, I just... just killing the little boy. <laughs> he said, no, I mean it. What are y'all doing? And my daddy looked over at him and said, while we're fishing. <laughs> and the little boy said, no. Daddy said, yeah. What are you fishing for? And my daddy said, for the man in the moon. And I didn't even know he had a sense of humor. So, you know, the stories came. You know, they, they, some of them were very sad, but they came and they came and they came. And uh, finally we had a book to write. But I might not have done it if it hadn't been for the boy. The boy, uh, I, I am qualified to be a father about like, well, I could poke a little fun at the past eight years, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> let's just say that if all you got to do to be head of FEMA is run a horse show, I'm your next director. 